Hi everyone, um, I'm Dr. Robert Zabo from the Low Carb Clinic. Um, I'd first of all like to thank Rod very much for inviting me to speak today about a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, the title of my talk is How to Reverse Type 2 Diabetes. Uh, I might just give you a bit of an introduction as to how I got involved in low carbohydrate nutrition. Uh, it all started about seven years ago when I was personally diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which was quite a shock to me at the time. I was only 37 years old um, and felt great and um, had an insurance medical and uh, was found to be quite diabetic at that time. Um, I wasn't particularly overweight, maybe about 10 kilos heavier than I am now, but um, um, had that full-blown diagnosis. And um, after uh, you know going through the usual progress of seeing specialists and, and a dietitian who said I was eating perfectly. Um, I kind of um, was a bit dumbfounded that I had a lifestyle disease and yet apparently had a healthy lifestyle uh, until I found out about low carbohydrate diets and um, that uh, they had the potential to reverse type 2 diabetes. And so I undertook that about six years ago and have really very rapidly reversed my type 2 diabetes at that time and have maintained it um, in remission since that time. So that was quite an amazing eye-opening journey for me and um, couldn't but implement that with my patients. And so since that time, I've been really um, active in, do, in terms of doing that with as many patients as possible with really amazing results. So um, I guess, you know, that's how I've got to be involved with um, um, the low carb, I guess, community and um, I'm really happy to be able to share my learnings. Just a couple of disclosures. Um, well, as I said, I'm, I'm the co-founder of the Low Carb Clinic, so I'm going to be talking about different ways in which type 2 diabetes can be reversed today. One of them is low carbohydrate diets, and um, you know, I guess you know, I have that conflict potentially having that clinic name. The other, other is an intellectual conflict, which is the fact that there are other ways to reverse type 2 diabetes, but my experience has been so profound with this, both personally and with my patients, that I have a bias and it's important for me to acknowledge that I um, am biased based on what I've seen, which I can't unsee, but there are other ways as well that we can potentially reverse type 2 diabetes. And we need to provide our patients with all of the options because what might be right for one person may not be right for um, everybody else. Okay, so just first of all, starting off with the problem, and as you're probably all aware, you know, this is a, a massively growing issue. Um, in terms of the prevalence, it was actually quite hard to find up-to-date data, and this is a 2012 Australian data which had a prevalence of um, combined pre-diabetes and diabetes of 23.7% of the adult population. Um, and so, you know, about a, about a quarter of all adults based on this, but it's likely to be much higher because this data didn't include HbA1c as a diagnostic criteria. It was only a fasting glucose or a um, abnormal glucose tolerance test. And so there's those three ways that we can diagnose diabetes. It's the fasting glucose, glucose tolerance, or a HbA1c. So this excluded that HbA1c. This data was also from 2012 and it was from America. It included HbA1c as well. And in the adult population, there was a 52% prevalence of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes combined. So over half of the adult population there um, were diagnosed in one of those two. And it's most likely going to be something more similar to that in Australia. So, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. This is, we're talking massive epidemic proportions. You know, this is kind of plague proportions, really. If, if you include, I mean, these are people who can't control their glucose anymore. Um, there's going to be a whole bunch of other people that have got insulin resistance, which causes type 2 diabetes, who can still control their glucose. And if you were to add those people onto the 52% who can no longer maintain a normal glucose, um, but that, that have insulin resistance, we're probably talking something like 85 to 90% of the population that have this insulin resistance problem. And it's pretty extraordinary to think that maybe only 10 to 15% of the population are actually healthy. Okay, so what do our peak bodies say? Diabetes Australia, I just pulled out a couple of quotes here. Um, for, first one is, we do not know what causes type 2 diabetes, which I find it pretty extraordinary. Um, why are they saying this? You'd have to ask Diabetes Australia. I think it's, we, it's, there's pretty good data that what causes it is sugar and a high carbohydrate intake. So they're the pretty well-known causes of type 2 diabetes. 
They also say type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition. So basically, just that it's going to get worse. This is the way it is. They also say, over time, most people with type 2 diabetes will also need tablets, and many will eventually require insulin. It is important to note that this is the natural progression of the condition. And taking tablets or insulin as soon as they are required can result in fewer long-term complications. So but again, basically just reiterating this paradigm that type 2 diabetes is progressive, it gets worse, and it's going to need medicating at some point in time. Interestingly, there's no mention of reversibility of type 2 diabetes anywhere on the website. And what about the College of General Practitioners? Uh, in 2018, they put out some guidelines for the general practice management of type 2 diabetes. Similarly, they mentioned that it was progressive. Um, to their um, credit, they mentioned that there um, is a scope for weight management using low calorie or uh, diets or bariatric surgery, which are the other two ways in which we can reverse diabetes that we'll speak about. But there was no mention of reversibility. They did say that there was some um, uh, possibility that low carbohydrate diets um, under the um, issues under debate section, um, uh, that that approach might be considered when more evidence is available. So they just mentioned that briefly, tucked it in at the very end, um, keeping in mind that what they recommended or what they talked about with low carbohydrate diets was um, fat in a diet that wasn't saturated fat. So still very much um, fearful of saturated fat as far as they were concerned. Again, no mention of reversibility. This is a slide of um, a brochure that appeared in my pigeonhole at work from our friends at AstraZeneca. And it really kind of talks about diabetes as being this one-way street. It's this same paradigm that Diabetes Australia has talked about and the RACGP have talked about as just being gradually getting worse. And in this diagram, we start from the left where there's um, diet and exercise um, is the first um, methods that are suggested. Then we add metformin. Um, then we add, which is an oral medication, and then we add a second medication, maybe a third, and then eventually some injectables such as insulin or other injectables. So it's really, the arrows just keep going. And that's just um, um, the paradigm that you know, is currently being used, and um, we'll come back to this in a little bit. So what about this idea of reversibility? Well, it's actually quite an old idea. We have lots and lots of data on this, surprisingly. You would think, looking at these things, that there isn't any. Well, actually, this study was done in 1985. Um, it was a, a fairly small study. It was only 30 participants, and they um, were followed over 40 days and were given a very, very low calorie diet. So they were only given about 330 calories per day, which is, I mean, near nothing. So they were really kind of starved for about 40 days. Um, and um, they found that, that, that this was highly effective at normalizing these diabetic um, patients' blood glucose levels most of that normalization actually occurred within the first 10 days. So it was very, very rapid. And um, 40 days after refeeding, after they went back to eating their regular diet, the majority of people that had normalization of glucose retained normalization of their glucose levels. So we've actually seen this a very long time ago, decades ago. Since this time, we've had many, many more publications that have shown reversibility. Um, this one was published in 2018. Um, it was the direct trial, which was a study of uh, also low calorie diets. Um, 306 people were randomized into either a low calorie diet or just eating whatever they wanted to. The low calorie diet consisted of 850 calories per day over three to five months. And um, at 12 months, there was a HbA1c that was in a non-diabetic range. Um, of 46% of the low calorie participants versus only 4% of the um, standard treatment patients. And the authors said, uh, our findings show that at 12 months, almost half of participants achieved remission to a non-diabetic state and off anti-diabetic drugs. And that's the other thing is that those people, the 46% who um, had reversed their diabetes had done that by actually also not only um, uh, had they reversed it, but they'd reversed it off medications. Uh, they said that remission of type 2 diabetes is a practical target for primary care. Uh, similarly, we've got this bariatric surgery data, which is enormous. This, this was the STAMPEDE trial. Um, this is the five-year outcome data. Uh, the STAMPEDE trial um, were 150 people that were randomised to either bariatric surgery or just intensive medical therapy. Uh, the criteria that they had were HbA1c less than 6. 
um, w on or off medications, so didn't use, um, they didn't require people to be off. And they found that um, at five years, this was still 29% of participants had, were in their, de their definition of remission compared to um, only 5% of people who were on the intensive medical therapy um, um, this study um, tells us a little bit about who's more uh, likely to be a, be a, um, go into remission. Um, this is a, also a low calorie um, diet study and it was, had 30 participants that were on a very low calorie diet for um, eight weeks, less than 700 calories per day. Um, and 40% of them achieved a fasting glucose of less than seven. They called these people the responders. Um, so most responders, um, they had remained in remission after six months of going back to their regular diet. So what actually constituted someone, uh, what, what led them to be more likely to be a responder? Well, um, a more recent diagnosis was probably the biggest factor. So the people who had had diabetes for the shortest period were far more likely to be uh, responders. Also the people that had um, a high um, level of insulin in their bloodstream, in other words, their pancreas was working really, really well. Um, the more insulin they had, the more um, likely they were to be able to reverse their diabetes. Higher body weight was similarly associated with the ability to reverse and obviously higher body weight is usually due to higher insulin levels, so that all makes sense. And the ability to regenerate pancreatic cells. So there's a um, condition called fatty pancreas that is uh, strongly linked with type 2 diabetes. And what fat accumulation in pan pancreatic cells leads to is kind of a, st a stunning of those cells. They, they, they get stunned and can't actually make insulin anymore. Um, it's, it's to do with uh, de-differentiation. So we've got kind of, um, many people have heard of stem cells that can be turned into any cell in the body. And then we've got these um, beta cells which are making insulin in the pancreas and there's steps along that path to becoming a specialized cell. What happens when you've got a fatty a fatty beta cell is that it de-differentiates it, it kind of becomes less specialised and it no longer can make insulin. Clearing of that fat out of the pancreatic cell can make it re-differentiate. It goes back into being a fully functional cell and the ability for, for you to clear fatty pancreas, that was also a factor in becoming a responder. If you've got a fatty, fatty pancreas cell for too long, it, it can die and then you've lost that capacity. But early on, while you've still got um, a, a, a cell that's viable and alive, you potentially can actually regenerate pancreatic function. And we've actually, there's so much data that we've actually got two recent reviews of diabetes reversibility. Um, these two papers um, have lots and lots of information about the many, many studies that have been done, particularly the one by Sarah Helberg on, on the right there is one that I've um, mind for a lot of the information from today and um, for anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more about the evidence for reversibility, that's a great review to have a look at. So what about big peak bodies? Well, thankfully now, um, last year, there were two uh, major um, publications that um, told us about that, that actually for the very first time in guidelines, major international guidelines, talked about reversibility and talked about the fact that this is something that is a real concept. So for those practitioners or patients that are out there that are thinking, is this still a fringe thing? Well, no, we actually have the American Diabetes Association in conjunction with the um, European Association for the um, Study of Diabetes, as well as a report by the WHO, both individually have talked about the evidence that exists for reversing type two diabetes. So it's no longer fringe. This is something that is mainstream, that we can now discuss. We can discuss it with our patients as treating practitioners, and you can talk to your doctor about this too, because this is now in major international guidelines. Um, and look, unfortunately, these didn't talk about reversal as being an aspiration, which is what I would have thought, you know, if you've got a disease that is a major illness that you can reverse, surely you'd mention that in the first sentence as an opening um, paragraph, but um, that wasn't the case. They were tucked out at the bottom at the, uh, at the end of the reports um, and they'd spoke about um, low calorie diets and also bariatric surgery only um, as being the ways in which we can reverse type 2 diabetes. But nevertheless, it was actually part of these reports. So please feel free to talk to your doctor, talk to your patients about this idea of reversibility. 
which now opens us back up to opening a second lane in this road. You know, the paradigm that we've been taught is that diabetes is a one-way street, it gets worse, it's progressive, and the most you might be able to hope for is to slow that speed down. You're still going to travel in that direction, but you know, you might go faster, you might go slow. Well, in fact, you can do a U-turn and you can go the other way and you can actually open this second lane. So I think that that's a really important new concept that we need to be thinking about with our patients. So how do we define reversal? Well, it really depends on the study. So as you can see, there's, there's different um, definitions in different studies. Um, generally speaking, a HbA1c less than 6.5 is considered non-diabetic. Um, and whether that's on or off medications, I think usually people would consider that to be off medications. However, um, perhaps including metformin within that definition is something that some, um, some authors discuss. So I guess it's not a black and white thing, but I think 6.5 less than that is a, is a pretty good starting point. Okay, there's three ways that we can reverse type, type 2 diabetes. Uh, bariatric surgery, uh, very, low, very low calorie diets and the low carbohydrate diets, which is um, my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so with the bariatric surgery, there's two types. There's the Ruan Y gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy, which I've just briefly put here only because I kind of forgot about what was going on with um, the anatomy here. So I thought I'd better, better refresh my memory if not everybody else's. Um, Ruan Y is a more invasive procedure, but more effective. Um, not done as often because of the fact that it's got a higher complication rate, but um, it's reversible, potentially. Unlike the sleeve gastrectomy, which is cutting away most of the stomach, is irreversible, slightly less effective, um, and a lower complication rate. Um, so the Ruan Y is actually connecting the bottom part of the, well, it's actually the first part of the stomach up to the second part of the small bowel, so the jejunum, and you've just got the stomach, which is just sitting there doing nothing at all. Now, bariatric surgery really, really works. It's incredibly effective at reversing type 2 diabetes, and it does so really quickly. It does it way before weight loss. Usually within the first week or two post-surgery, people have gone into remission much before they've lost any substantial weight. Um, it's, um, it's thought to be due to the changes in the intestinal hormones, the incretins that are secreted um, following the surgery. So, you know, I guess the thing to say about the surgery, it's pretty drastic, but it, it really, really works. It's really, really effective. And we have the most amount of evidence for it. It's been studied for the longest. It's got the most number of trials that have been done. Um, and in fact, up to 80% of people will have remission in the short term. Now, 10 year data isn't as, as effective. It's, um, the studies have shown sort of between 36 and 83%. Mostly it's between the 40 to 50% mark. Um, there was one study that showed 83% uh, long-term um, remission, but nobody's else, nobody else has been able to repeat that. Um, and so it's usually that 40 to 50% 10-year remission. Um, and as I was saying, there was the 29% um, remission of five years in that stampede trial, but then they had a, a stricter definition. Now the cons, well, it's, it's a big one. It involves surgery and it's pretty major surgery too. And I think for us clinicians talking to our patients, that's probably, I guess, the biggest con is the fact that we're, when a person's feeling reasonably well, it's really hard to convince them to have a major operation that's gonna cut out part of their stomach. You know, it's very, it's much easier to convince someone to have an operation when they're feeling sick. You know, if you've got a lot of pain because you've got a gallstone, you know, most people are quite happy to have an operation to, to fix that. But when they're sitting there in your office uh, talking about this, long-term condition, it's pretty hard to then sort of convince them to go under the knife. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big issue. It's all very well for us to talk about the evidence and all of the data that exists for this, but to us actually get a patient to the point where they were gonna to agree to having an operation is a different thing altogether. There's a big hurdle there. And there are risks, obviously. And um, you know, there's that 13 to 21% uh, risk rate. Um, we don't know what happens in terms of remission beyond five to 10 years. So we don't know if it's gonna deteriorate or maintain. Um, uh, the um, sleeve gastrectomy is irreversible. Um, and there is quite a bit of weight gain. So about a 30% increase in weight um, at the two to five year mark. The potential for micronutrient deficiencies. I mean, this is all kind of, it's quite a long cons list, unfortunately. And the cost, you know, it's about $18,000 Australian uh, money um, per person. 
And the other one that I've put down is that, sure, it works for the individual, but you know, we're, we're talking about a surgical solution for a dietary disease here, and that's all very well and good, but we, um, it comes about through a food environment in which we live and through food habits. And so if we have a parent or parents who have got diabetes who are having a surgical solution for their dietary disease, is that going to stop their kids from growing up to have diabetes too? And are we going to have to operate on them too? And does that mean that everybody is just going to end up with an operation at some point and we end up operating for a dietary disease? And that seems a bit warped to me when surely we should be looking at the cause and maybe changing that food environment and dietary habits to actually prevent our children from needing to have an operation. So that point of, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily prevent the next case. It might help that individual, but what about all of the people that are going to line up for surgery beyond that? So I think that's a philosophical point, but I think it's something that many of us would agree is perhaps not ideal. So moving on, uh, low calorie diets we've talked about. Um, again, rapid improvement. So people get a quick response with the HbA1c and with weight. The cons, well, um, is the big rebound and all of the studies show that within 12 to 24 months after initiation of a low calorie diet, when people go back onto eating what they were eating before, their um, HbA1c and their weight rebounds quite quickly. And that's the big problem with low calorie diets. Um, now, the other part from a uh, doctor's point of view is hunger. And, you know, again, when you've got somebody who's sitting there, you know, enjoying their food, it's really hard to then convince them to become hungry for the next three to six months. <laughs> Those people are not really that keen to do that. So it's a hard sell in that regard. And the, the question is, that, so the last point is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the studies. You know, some studies use certain calorie points, others use a different point and use different durations. So there's no um, consensus on what the best way to approach this is. And so what do you, how do you define low calorie and how long do you go for is a bit unclear. Something that I'm a bit concerned about with low calorie diets too is the effect on your basal metabolic rate. And we know that when you calorie restrict that you shrink your BMR, which is the basal metabolic rate is where you burn most of your calories, which is um, a bit like um, saying that, um, so BMR is like the energy that we burn doing nothing at all, just running on idle. And it's about 60 to 70% of our energy utilization, only 30 to 40% is being active. And um, when we calorie restrict, that 60 to 70% shrinks, we actually burn less for the months and maybe even years following the calorie restriction. Um, we don't know how long it takes for that BMR to recover. Um, and so I guess I do con I'm concerned about uh, low calorie diets having an impact that might lead to when people then eat rebounding and actually gaining more weight than they started with because of the fact that they've got this shrunken BMR. Um, this graph shows rebound. Um, the top graph is weight um, and the bottom graph, the bar graph is the HbA1c decrease. Um, it shows low calorie diets um, were all but two of them, the one in blue and the one in pink, um, the Verta and the Tay. Those are the uh, low carbohydrate diets. So it's comparing low carbohydrate and low calorie diets. And what we can see is that, so the yellow one, for example, is a low calorie diet. And you can see how there's quite a significant rebound. Um, and even in the bottom graph was the HbA1c. Initially, that yellow graph, um, that yellow bar, was quite a drop in HbA1c, but then by about the 18 month mark, all of that improvement in HbA1c was gone. Whereas the low carbohydrate diets had maintained a lot of the improvement. All right, so now onto uh, my favorite topic, which is low carbohydrate diets. Um, there's plenty of data on this. We've got 22 randomized controlled trials. Uh, we've got 10 non-randomized controlled trials. We've got 10 meta-analyses, 10 studies that have greater than 100 participants. So pretty big studies. We have 10 studies that are a year or longer and six studies that are two years or longer. So the data is enormous. We have a huge body of data. This is the number of trials that have been done for on the right low carbohydrate diets. Um, so more than any other type of diet, you can see the much lauded Mediterranean diet has 
fewer than half combined randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses than low carbohydrate diets. So, you know, it's quite extraordinary to realize that we have more information on low carbohydrate diets than we do for the Mediterranean. Um, and also comparing to the plant-based and the DASH diets. So huge body of evidence there. Um, this was a, um, a meta-analysis done for low carbohydrate diets that looked at lots of different other studies. Um, they found that basically um, the greater the carbohydrate restriction, the better the result. And what they wrote there, the greater the glucose lowering, which kind of makes sense. You would think you've got a condition whereby you can't control your blood glucose. Uh, most likely it's going to be that the less glucose you eat, the better you control your disease. So not a surprise. Um, they found again, like I said, that early intervention in the disease is more likely to be successful in terms of reversal. Uh, and they, um, they found that the studies have a fairly um, wide range of different support levels. Generally speaking, the more support that people had, the more likely they were to be successful um, long term. So that support seemed to be uh, quite important. This is a study which is a really impressive uh, trial, the Verta uh, Health trial, which is um, going to be a five-year um, non-randomised prospective control trial. It has 465 participants, 378 into the active arm and 87 in usual care. Um, there's, um, so it's a really impressive trial that used a phone app um, to provide the support. There's medical supervision, a personal health coach and on-demand resources. The people who were in this study were sick. So they weren't people with short-term diabetes. They'd had it for a long time, on average 8.4 years. So they chose the hard patients in this study, not the easy patients. They ensured that they were um, monitored for eating a low carbohydrate diet by checking their ketones, which was a good way to ensure compliance and in fact found that people were generally adhering to the diet. The retention rate was really impressive, it was 83% at one year and 74% at two years. And we only have two year data at this stage, but those are amazing in terms of retention. You know, if you had a drug that had those types of retention rates, it would be amazing. It's very rare to achieve that. And so to get the results and to get the retention, you know, if you had those, the levels of results and retention um, in this study with a drug, it'd be a blockbuster. You'd sell it by the bucket load. So very impressive uh, results there. These were the 12 month data. Um, they had a mean HbA1c of 7.6 starting to start with and down to 6.3 in one year on average. By 10 weeks, uh, there was a reduction down to 6.5. So it was quite a rapid improvement. And the two year data, there was a slight increase in HbA1c average at two years, but the majority of the improvement was retained. This graph shows a comparison between that trial, uh, which is the purple, the low carbohydrate trial in, um, on the bottom, with bariatric surgery, which is sleeve gastrectomy and um, gastric bypass in the blue and the red, and very low calorie diets in the green. And what you can see is basically that the low carbohydrate diet is as effective as the most effective bariatric surgery. So it's really on a par with the bypass there and it's mapping at two years. It'll be really interesting to see beyond that what the improvements continue to be because as I said before, when you've got a surgical solution to a dietary disease, if you've still got the cause, that being the diet, I do wonder whether maybe you're going to have worse outcomes compared to if you remove the cause and with the low carbohydrate diets, that's what we're doing with removing the cause. And I really wonder whether maybe the three, four, five year data is going to have a superior outcome to the, to the surgery. So that'll be really interesting to see as time goes on. And this is the weight reduction, which is very similar in terms of the proportion or the magnitude on a low carbohydrate diet compared to the bariatric surgery. You can see the rebound there with the low, cal low calorie diets. Other one year results with the VERTA trial was, well, there's the HbA1c reduction compared to in the, on the left column is the um, usual care treatment. Um, um, then glucose levels, uh, insulin level decreases, uh, HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance, decreases in that. Um, and the number of diabetic medications re reduced. So 
whereas there was an increase in diabetic medication, medications in usual arm, which is not surprising given that progressive paradigm, there was a big decrease in medications in the low carbohydrate arm. So not only were you in improving your diabetes, but you were getting off medications at the same time. These are the medications that people ceased. So in the dark, uh, dark bluey green color at the bottom um, were all the ceased medications. Uh, there were a few commenced medications, but a lot more ceased. And this is something that I think is really important is the inflammatory change. So um, you can see the, H, uh, the CRP, which is an inflammatory marker. And in the verta, the low carbohydrate arm, a big decrease in inflammation. And if you think about what causes things like heart attacks or cancers or Alzheimer's, it's inflammation. It's long-term, low-grade, smouldering inflammation. And you reverse that by doing a low-carbohydrate diet. So not only are you getting diabetes benefit, but you're probably going to be getting a whole lot of other preventative benefits from a whole range of diseases. You know, and as a lot of you know, any medical practitioner will tell you that diabetes is not one diagnosis, it's a thousand diagnoses. So if you have the power to not just reverse that one, but potentially prevent however many other diagnoses might follow it, that's powerful. Okay, so the pros and cons for low carbohydrate diets. Well, first of all, it works and it works in the long term. We now have two year data that shows that it's as effective as bariatric surgery. There's no surgical risk. It's safe. Hypothetically, there, there is a risk of hypoglycemia or low glucose levels, but none of the patients in the VERTA trial in the 380 people or so that were being treated had any hypoglycemic effect, um, events. Uh, and it's sustainable. It's, um, as we saw, the retention rate was really high uh, and it reduces hunger, unlike low calorie diets that increase hunger. So that's a consistent finding that people uh, report is that they have much less hunger. Well, the cons are that it requires long-term adherence. It's not like just doing three months of a low calorie diet or having an operation and then going back to doing whatever you like. It actually does require you to make a change and a change for life. So that there is, you know, some um, downside to that in the sense that you need to stick with it. You know, if you reintroduce the cause, i.e. the carbohydrates, you're going to get the disease. So it's about taking that cause away long term. And we probably need higher levels of support because of that long term requirement for sort of sticking to the diet. And I guess for any of the clinicians that are watching, I just encourage us all to think about more creative ways that we can engage our patients into the long term to provide them with that long term support. And the food choices are a bit limited in some food environments. Some restaurants don't have choices for us and, you know, some um, it's a bit hard to, you know, walk into I don't know, a survey station when you're paying your fuel and be confronted by all of these, you know, sugary, starchy treats. It's, you know, the food environment is quite challenging. And there might be some cultural or um, emotional reasons why people might struggle to, to give up carbohydrates. You know, some people have food addictions and to get the idea of giving up these carbohydrates might not be acceptable. Um, there might be religious or other cultural issues um, that might prevent people from taking it on. Just one other note that I was going to mention is that going on a low carbohydrate diet, I'd strongly recommend that anybody um, who's on one of these categories of medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, there's three of them that are listed there, um, to speak to their doctor before they embark on a low carbohydrate diet. And these drugs have been, although they're very effective for diabetes, they've been um, associated with some deaths due to uh, fatal ketoacidosis. Um, the, the drugs themselves is what causes ketoacidosis, but it seems like probably on a low carbohydrate diet, when you have a low level of um, nutritional ketosis, which is healthy, that might um, trigger that, that ketoacidosis more commonly. So I've, um, I always stop all of my patients who are on any of these medications from um, taking them when they go into a low carbohydrate diet. And I think that's probably wise. And if I may just give a couple of my sort of learnings in the seeing the you know, hundreds of patients that I've treated in this way over the years, what I've sort of discovered and um, what I've found works for, for more of them is that I think low carbohydrate diets are good, but actually intermittent fasting is best. 
And the way I view low carbohydrate diets is that they enable fasting through that profound decrease in hunger. The people that actually utilize that decrease in hunger to go for longer periods without food, they're the ones that really nail it. They're the ones that get the results and are really, really happy with the outcomes. And you know, when they eat, they eat as much as they like to get full, but then just don't do it very often. Those are really the ones that succeed. I think it's also useful to differentiate foods that have virtually zero carbohydrate versus what we might call low carbohydrate. So, you know, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, cheese, those are kind of essentially zero in, in carbohydrate. But, um, and they're not going to give you much of a blood sugar response. Whereas things like yogurt, low carb breads, sort of certain products that are manufactured that are labeled low carb, those are the ones that have some carbohydrate and for a diabetic that might, too much of those foods can be a problem. So I think there's an easy sort of assumption that if something's labeled low carb, that it's fine on a low carb diet. But the point is a lot of low carb food isn't low carb anymore. So I'd really, really, um, I guess what I would hope from making this presentation is that anybody who's a treating practitioner from um, after having listened to this can, is, is com confident and, and happy and talk to, talks to their patients about this two-way street concept of diabetes. Realise that it's not just a progressive condition, it can be a reversible condition. If not completely reversible, at least partially reversible. And that they talk to their patients about this option. You know, this is something that is, is now available and, and mainstream in a sense. So please don't feel nervous about talking to uh, your patients about this. Please do it often, do it um, and, and give them the option. I think um, the, um, there are three options as we talked about today. And although you know, I think low carbohydrate diets are the best, they're not for everyone. And so we need to give our patients all of their options. We need to talk about surgery and uh, low calorie diets because they work and um, you know, what works for one person might not work for another person. So please um, you know, give your patients your options, which is all what this is all about, which is about patient empowerment and patient choice. So um, yeah, I hope you got something out of today. Thank you.